So, round of applause for, you know. Well, thanks for having me. How's everyone doing? It's been a long day, lots of containers. Uh, it's been fun. Uh, my name is Yunan. Um, I'm a software engineer on Netflix. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about slaying containers. I mean, slaying monoliths. There's the Freudian slip. <laughs> Slay monoliths with Node and, and, and Docker. And uh, for those of you, one of these must work. There we go. For those of you uh, unfamiliar with Netflix, living under the rock for the last 10 years, uh, started with a simple idea, right? Watch all of your favorite TV shows and movies anytime, anywhere. Um, and lately, we've been putting out these great original series. Has anyone seen any of these shows? Uh, it's great. Uh, the one in the middle is personally my favorite, BoJack Horseman. Uh, great comedy. And you guys might have seen this as well. You know, we recently made this worldwide expansion. So, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, and so, we're now in almost every country in the world. And with that, we've also had some skyrocketing subscriber growth. So, just over 20 million subscribers in 2011 until our last quarter when we had close to 75 million. And so, with this stunning growth and our coupled with our global expansion, as well as our moving to originals content, uh, we have a unique set of scaling challenges, as you guys can probably imagine, here at Netflix. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the history and sort of the evolution of our, of our scaling. Um, and so you want to watch Netflix, right? It's easy. It's just all in the cloud. You hop on a device, hits the cloud, we're all done. All the engineers on Netflix do nothing all day because it's just all in the cloud, right? We just sit around and watch TV. Uh, turns out the cloud isn't actually, there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. And so. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we have to start with this cloud picture, but we have to evolve it, right? So what does our API look like? Well, we'll talk about the evolution of our API service layer and how it's evolved right along with our growth. And so one of the biggest things with Netflix is we let you watch it on any device, right? Anywhere. Um, but in the beginning, actually, all we had were browsers. And so how did that work? Well, it turns out that all we had was a, a vanilla JVM-based web server. And uh, inside of the cloud, right, we had this web server over here. Um, and we had basically a web server that would render all of our UI to the browser. And then we had client jars that, that, that we would incorporate into the web server that would hit the multitude of our backend microservices, something that we're, we're, we're really well known for. And uh, this is good. Uh, we had lots of microservices. Each of them had different de behaviors uh, that we could leverage uh, with, by using a, a, a a specific client, and it both render the UI as, as well as access the data, right? So let's play a game called Spot the Monolith. Can anyone spot the monolith? Right there, right? Uh, so what are some issues with the monolith? If you want to change the API and the data access layer, uh, you've got to wait for a new jar or a new client to be built. So that's slow. Uh, we have to combine both rendering the UI as well as data access. And so that's not so great if I'm the UI, the, the UI team and I want to push new markup or change a specific role, I have to push the web service. If I want to update the way I access data, push the web service, right? And all this, all this code is, is, is living together and that's, that's difficult. And at some point we realize that, hey, not everyone wants to just watch on the browsers. They want to watch on all of these devices too. And devices don't really talk to a web browser. So let's talk about the next step in our API evolution, right? How do we make it work for all of our devices? Any ideas? What do people usually do when they need to present a homogenous way to access data? Uh, oh, that was a little. Right, so we, yeah, we start with the web server. We, move, we quickly move to, to, to a REST API, right? And that's pretty standard. Um, it, unlocked, it gave us the, unlocked the ability for us to support more devices than just the browser. And we've sort of, you know, burned the monolith, so to speak. We've got this REST API um, that's responsible for accessing data and a bunch of clients that uses it to access the data. And this, was, this was good. Uh, it let us to deploy all of these devices to the field um, and sort of you know, give everyone else, give everyone a great, great customer experience. But at the same time, there were some drawbacks, right? Uh, a REST API is still somewhat inflexible. Imagine that you are, are the iOS team and you wanted to make a change to a specific API. Well, you have to go work with the backend team and you, they, may have, they may push every couple of weeks or something, so you're stuck until they make a push. So it's inflexible. And, and it's also inefficient, right? In order for me to render all the different roles and the, all the different movies, I have to make multiple REST-based rest HTTP calls, which is slow, and that's not what we want. And over time, because we were making so many changes to the REST API, it got pretty complex and bloated, and it was hard to maintain. So let's move on to sort of the next uh, 
evolution in our saga, right? What, we wanted to evolve our API to sort of knock out all of those problems. And what, what, what are some of the goals that we were looking for? Well, rapid innovation, right? As we brought more and more devices online, um, these devices want to be able to innovate their APIs more quickly. Um, they didn't want to be stuck to a, a REST-based service that could only you know, change every couple of weeks, and it was inflexible. Also, they wanted the API to be custom tailor made, bespoke, one might say, for themselves, right? And so that meant that you know, they, they wanted to be able to write an API without having to support all of the infrastructure that comes from having to run, um, run an API service. And performance really mattered as well, right? We wanted to be able to get data. We don't want to have to make multiple round trips to get all the data that we wanted to render a particular request. And so the existing API didn't, REST API didn't scale, right? And we introduced something that we run today called API.next. And this is sort of the next evolution uh, in our API design. And this re represented a paradigm shift. Uh, instead of having a, a REST-based API, um, we let clients write their own APIs in the form of scripts so they can inject um, onto the API server. So this is really moving to a platform as a service model. You have all these client teams that can write data access scripts however they like, so basically write their own APIs, and it was frictionless because they could upload these scripts whenever they liked in the production. Um, they didn't have to run any, any infrastructure um, because client teams are not you know, familiar or don't have the expertise to do that. We had an API team that ran the server infrastructure, but at any time they could inject and upload any script that they wanted, and they, this really gave us sort of the infrastructure that we needed to push to you know, the hundreds of devices that we support and the hundreds and thousands of A-B, AB tests that we support. But uh, the model just reappears, right? So we've gotten our, you know, our, our really great sort of uh, velocity out of this, but now we've got this monolith again. We've got scripts, UI scripts running inside the same process as, as data access clients. And in fact, there are some big problems with this as we've, as we've um, been hitting our scale rate recently. So 42 and a half billion hours watched in 2015. It's a lot of hours. Uh, we have massive RPS through this system. Um, you could think of it as billions per day. And we have thousands of scripts actively in prod right now. So we have literally have like a thousand API endpoints that, that all the client teams are working with. These, and and ten, tens of thousands in tests, and these all live inside the same physical process. And the, the changes are made to, to these scripts quite frequently, almost hundreds of them a day to production. And we also have, obviously we, we, with the goal of trying to support hundreds of, hundreds of these A-B tests. So software wise, we've broken out like, oh, the data access scripts live over here, and clients live over there, and the velocity has been really great because teams can push their own individual APIs without having to wait for, for an API team to change them. But there's some vertical scaling issues, right? Um, we're fast approaching the scaling limits of the largest, most expensive instances that we can buy in the cloud. And obviously that's because there's some memory and I.O. pressures with having to run this many scripts. And uh, of course there's also some isolation issues, as you can imagine. Um, there's resource contention, right? Uh, there's individual incentives for each script versus the group incentive, which is the individuals want to have as much resources as possible, but as a group, you want to make sure that everyone gets their fair shake. And we also have this issue where we could have one bad errand script that takes out all of Netflix. And this has actually happened in the past, and obviously because of the lack of isolation. And conflicting dependencies is also a subtle issue. Which version of Log4j do you use? Among a thousand scripts, you have to pick one. Right? And lastly, developer ergonomics was also an issue. Um, you kind of have this separation here uh, along that dotted line. Um, so everything to the left of that is uh, written by UI engineers. And everything to the right are written by systems engineers. And there's this natural tug of war, and then sort of we wanted to set, there's no separation of concerns, right? Um, in fact, if you look at sort of the runtime, um, most of our clients today are written in JavaScript. But if you wanted to write your APIs, you have to write it in Groovy. Does anyone still use Groovy? I just wrote some Groovy the other day, but you know, it's, not, it's not as fun as it seems. This is in 2007. So it's kind of inefficient, um, to say the least. And deploying this takes, uh, takes hours. So you can imagine like, trying to actually work with these data access scripts. You can't run this big monolith on your local machine because it's too big. And so what, in fact, the development workflow for most of these engineers is really they upload their scripts to a test instance. Then they run it. And if they get a bug, what do they do? They add some print line statements, re-upload the scripts, run them again, and then they have to go through this iteration. Each iteration takes minutes or tens of minutes, and this really makes it infuriating for these engineers who are trying to work on the, the platform. So let's talk about you know, what we're really here to talk about today, which is the next evolution of our API platform, and, what, and sort of the lessons that we've learned from our previous uh, iterations. 
you know, as we get more and more devices and faster velocity of change and more original series and more customers, what are some of the goals for our next generation API platform and how, how can we take advantage of the new technology that exists out there? Well, in terms of requirements, the three biggest things are scalability, right? We're vastly approaching our scaling limits. Availability, we want Netflix to be available all the time. And we want developers to be productive. We want them to, to very easily develop new APIs for their, for their clients. If we talk about the first two points, scalability and availability, what really comes to mind is, well, we want process isolation, right? Um, that's, that's really, really important because we don't ever want one script to take down all of Netflix again. And we want to be able to scale everything horizontally, individually. So isolation is really important. Um, at the same time, we want to separate out those data access scripts from the API servers themselves, right? It seems like we're bleeding concerns. And if we separated them, we could scale them and architect and design them individually for what's best for themselves. And we want to reduce our infrastructure costs. Trust me, running the largest instances you can buy, and lots of them, isn't, isn't cheap at all. Um, and lastly, faster startup times, right? Um, we, want, we don't want to have to wait 45 minutes, I'm not joking, to start up an uh, instance of the API server. We want that to take seconds or minutes at the most. And, and developer productivity is actually really important as well. For all, most of these UI engineers, they're experts in JavaScript. Um, not many experts in Groovy out there, so we really want, they really want to be able to write JavaScript on a client as well as on the server when they're writing their APIs. And they want to be able to run and debug and develop these scripts locally. Right? Um, they want to be able to step through code, hit, hit, use a debugger, they don't want to have to upload these scripts. And when they want, they want um, this infrastructure to be fast uh, and provide fast incremental builds. And they want it to as closely mirror production as possible so that when they can, they can maybe pull down something from production and test it locally. And so we started with a monolith. This is sort of the monolith that we have now that that's working. Um, and it's got some really great features, right? Being able to inject scripts into the runtime without having to redeploy it is really great. Um, not having to run your own infrastructure as UI teams also, also a plus, and these are the things that we want to keep with the new architecture. And so what does that new architecture look like? Looks like something like this. Ha ha, containers, right? Um, and so what we've done is we've separated the data access scripts into their own individual containers running Node and JavaScript, and we moved all the data access layer into one uniformed uh, API called the remote service layer. And that remote service layer coordinates all the data access with all the backend services, but presents this one uniform um, access point, and then we still give uh, UI engineers the ability to write their own APIs whenever they like, deploy them, and develop them. We can we let them do that in their own individual isolated Docker containers. Now, process isolation is is great, right? Because that means that once once I've got these containers, um, I can bring a Docker image that's that's currently running in prod, deploy that locally, test it out. Um, these clients can now write in individual scripts that are containers, and all this is still sort of infrastructureless from the client's perspective. They're not running any of this infrastructure. At least that's what they, we would like, right? And so when we look at sort of the breakdown of, of um, the different languages that are available, this is nice as well, because now we've got JavaScript both on a client and JavaScript on a server with Node right inside the, the Docker container. So we look closely into what we call a no-core container. Um, what we see essentially is that it's just a set of JavaScript data access scripts, and it runs on Node and Restify, which is a Node.js based um, HTTP framework. And remember those Groovy scripts that were injected into the single monolith, now they're injected into their own isolated Docker containers. Um, so this is really good. Now how do we get this stuff out to production? Right? And how do we ensure that these things run seamlessly and with all the traits that we want in production? Well, um, there's about four things that we want to consider. One, it's the runtime platform. Right? It's important because we want to keep the contract with our UI teams, which is that, hey, you don't have to run any of your own infrastructure. Um, you should still not have to run your own infrastructure in the new world, right? So that's important. Managing these applications is also important. You want good tools to be able to manage versioning and routing and all of these things uh, and deployment. And we, we need a great in container infrastructure, which some of you might already, if you were at, around at lunch, um, Andrew Spiker from, from Netflix already talked about, but how do we actually get all these containers out running in the, in, the, in the AWS cloud right now, because that didn't really exist in Netflix, you know, VM world. And lastly, developer tooling, right? All this will be, uh, is sort of dead in the water if we don't give developers a seamless experience to write these a a APIs. So let's talk first about the runtime platform. Right, why do we care um, about the runtime platform? Well, I saw this tweet the other day that I thought was kind of funny, uh, which is that a full stack developer is one who can add technical debt to any layer of an application. 
I mean, this is a joke, obviously. I'm sure there's, there's you know, aliens out there who are really great at every step in the stack, but most of our UI engineers, our subject matter experts, are writing JavaScript. They don't actually care about running anything on the server, right? They don't want to care. All they want to do is what they're good at, which is writing these really awesome, innovative user interfaces for our customers. And the more we can take, sort of take that away in terms of infrastructure and servers, the better it is for them and for their productivity and for the company. And so our aim is to really provide a paved path for these data access apps. That means integrating with all of these subsystems that we already have today on Netflix that's available for all the services, things like metrics and alerting and auto scaling and load balancing, discovery, analytics, and so much more. And for those of you who do run production um, servers, you know that these things are all really, really important. And this is still important um, in, the, in, our, in our new world. We just want to make sure that we abstract these away from these engineers that are writing the code. And the, so, so the no-quark runtime, run, like, like I said before, runs as a platform as a service model, and it integrates with all of these subsystems that we already have built at Netflix, and it's a production-ready no platform. What this means is you as the UI engineer who's writing these APIs, all you have to bring is your JavaScript business logic code. You don't have to worry about the boilerplate of setting stuff up or connecting to all the downstream metric systems or setting up alerts. All this stuff is taken care of for, for you for the runtime, by the runtime platform. So all this stuff is free, essentially, right? And there's no infrastructure to manage um, for them. Now, of course, we make it available for you to tweak any of the things underneath the hood if you want, if you're a power user. But most of our, like I said, most of our UI engineers just want to write great UIs, write their data access scripts, and be done. So we give you the flexibility if you need it. So let's move on to the second point, which is application management, right? What are we trying to optimize over here? Well, simple app management. So we want to simplify the way you manage your apps. Um, but we want to make it really rock solid. So that involves sort of versioning. How do we version these apps? Um, deployment. How do I go about deploying these apps into the cloud? And how do we get operational insight into the applications themselves? So in terms of versioning, we, we've actually come up with a semantically version-based um, versioning scheme for all of our applications. So all the applications are semi-based. And as part, along with the semi uh, semantic version, we also include the Docker image, um, hash, um, and the SCM commit for you to exactly relate to which build and which deployment artifact as relates to your version. And something we think that's really innovative is we actually allow you to route your applications based on Summer. So if you include a summer like path inside your route, right, your applications will actually route based on Summer. Um, in terms of deploy deployment, uh, we're, we're working on this tool called Newt at Netflix, which is the Netflix workflow toolkit. This is its own talk, but it basically integrates with all of the existing systems um, and subtrees on Netflix to give developers a seamless experience from bootstrapping their development environment to deployment to monitoring, all of that stuff can be done through this one tool. And then that really helps provide that platform as a service sort of like contract. And additionally, you know, when things go wrong, we want operational insight. And so we're working on sort of automated standardized dashboards for all of these apps. So when you deploy an app, you get insights and metrics and latency and history all for free. Um, and, this, uh, and that integrates with a bunch of the op open source software that Netflix has built. And thirdly, container infrastructure. Um, those of you that who are here at lunch, um, Andrew gave a really great talk on Titus itself. But Titus is really the substrate that we use to get containers into the cloud, cloud deploy them safely, um, have them scale up and scale down for the service applications, get all the metrics in and out. And uh, again, it's its own talk. Um, but you guys should definitely check out Andrew's talk as well. And this is what we, we're going to use to deploy our uh, Docker containers in the cloud. And lastly, and perhaps even more importantly, because this is the thing that all of these UI engineers have been asking for, is developer tools, right? And the aim is, hey, I want to do all of this stuff locally. Never again do I ever want to upload my scripts to some test service, wait 10 minutes, and use print line statements, right? I want to be able to do this quickly and lo easily and locally on my, on my desktop, right? Um, because in the past, with the API.next service, it was so large that it was just impossible to run that locally. And with Docker this is, and containers, this is really good because containers, as you all know, are lightweight, and they spin up really, really quickly. Right? And so I can easily grab a, an image from, from my registry, deploy that locally, and start running and debugging and testing it. The problem with that is, as you all know, container images are also immutable. And so what if I'm actually doing local development and I'm changing my source code? Right? Do I have to rebuild everything, basically, you know, commit my code to SCM, build all the dependencies of my app, and then build a Docker image, right? This takes tens of minutes. This is really, really slow. So how do we fix this? Well, we're working on something for our uh, local deployment where we're actually deploying a container locally to your desktop. 
And then what we're doing is we're mounting a working, uh, your local working directory into the no-core container itself. And then we have live reload. So inside the container, there's a file system watcher. And it watches for changes to your local working environment. So if you're changing source code or config, it'll automatically either rebuild your application or bounce the application to pick up all the new changes. And the container also exposes a remote debugging port, so you can attach debuggers, um, you can get logging information very easily, and you can always uh, uh, bash into the container. And so this is really, if there's one thing that uh, the developers really want, it's, it's really this, right? This, is such a, this will be such a huge productivity boon for the engineers out there who are writing these scripts, because they can run everything locally. So a quick recap, right, containers. Why are containers great for this, for this architecture? Well, process isolation, right? Uh, you know, we never want one script to take down all of Netflix ever again. It gives us layered dependency management. And so that means that I can correctly lock all of my versions and not, never have to worry about whether I'll, I'll be able to get reproducible builds. And I can always, and I get portability across different environments. Bring my prod image into my local container, um, bring my local image into a test environment if I want to run it, run it out in the, in the cloud and deployments are really, really fast. What about Node, right? How is, why, why do we choose Node? Well, JS everywhere. Being able to run JavaScript on both the client and the server is huge for these UI engineers who are subject matter experts in JavaScript. It's performant, it's fast. Um, also, it's got the superb ecosystem of NPM modules that's out there, so there's lots of software out there, and it's been built for the web and it's not blocking, so it makes it really easy to code asynchronous um, APIs. And so a, a final repack, re recap on our new architecture, no cork. A um, couple of points we really wanted to focus on. Developer productivity, right? Just fast incremental builds, run everything, debug everything locally, and being able to run all your production code locally as well. And then in terms of scalability and availability, getting away from that monolith into microservices, both um, all running in containers, horizontally scalable, right? That's, that's really, really important. Process isolation, so every, Every set of scripts runs in its own container without having to impact others. Um, and you get immutable deployment artifacts, which means that you know, I can easily reproduce um, roll forward or roll backwards when I need to in production. So results, well, we, we plan on running a system test, some of this stuff uh, you know, in, in the next couple of months. And over the, over the next coming quarters, we, we are, uh, we'll be able to get most of the Netflix traffic over onto this new, new architecture. Did I mention we were hiring? If any of this stuff is interesting to all of you, uh, any of you, and you want to come help us out, work on any of the things that we talked about, we're definitely hiring. So come talk to the Netflix folks in the crowd, uh, me as well. And uh, thank you so much.